when we get together periodically, you know, they're, we're talking through and helping each other as our farmers and our clients are navigating challenges. And, and somebody will inevitably say, um, well, does anybody have any ideas for this? And I'm like, well, obviously have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, just clearly like, I'm just sitting there waiting for somebody to ask, you know, what's my opinion? And I, I and can almost always respond with, if you included, you know, say 10 pounds of hemp seed in your cover crop blend, what could that literally do for you provide additional? Hey guys, it's Mandy with Global Hemp Association. I wanted to say thank you so much for joining. I'm excited about the opportunity to build a relationship and connect this supply chain. I mean, after all, that's why we started the association. Our association was built on the foundation of connecting supply chain, building relationships, and helping you grow your business. Anyone from farmers, manufacturers, and distributors, people that are passionate about the supply chain, and those creating products selling into biofuels, plastics, textiles, construction, and building materials. Welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today. I hope everyone's weekend was epic. Um, I know mine was, and Christy, I bet yours was. Oh, you enjoyed your weekend. That's right. I was going to say you were just probably really busy out on the farm, but you got to get out. So that's awesome. But welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, for those of you that are just joining, welcome. We're the Global Hemp Association, and we're here to just educate and today talk about all things harvesting, um, I guess, all things in the crop all things crop, all things hemp. <laughs> and um, for those of you that haven't been to our website, check it out. We've got some awesome events coming up. If you go to the events tab and register, um, it's really exciting. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Christy. Christy, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me. And thank you very much for being willing to come on and take your time out of the day. Um, but I'd love to introduce or have you introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit about how you got into this industry and what are you doing right now in the industry? Thank you so much, Mandy, and to the Global Hemp Alliance. This is so great to be able to share what I do and to um, just just to share the message of industrial hemp in this context. Um, but hemp isn't all that I do, as you mentioned there, um, because it is uh, what we would consider a relatively new industry. And in a lot of ways, we're actually um, in the labor and delivery room for a new industry right now. So there's a lot of um, pain and suffering. There's some the occasional gnashing of teeth and um, not to mention all the unexpected challenges that we face on a daily basis um, with basically inventing a new industry. So um, there's some really um, fun momentum that's been you know building and building and building. And, and um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on me. So I started in the agricultural industry as an agronomist about 12 years ago or so now, um, it's almost been 13 years. And as I have grown in my agronomy chops, um, I'm an, I have educated myself in agronomy slightly differently. I went to school for business. I didn't necessarily go to school for ag. And so I spent much of my 20s in marketing and sales, business development, and um, communication. So that's where I learned to build relationships with people, connect with people, and to um, to get very well good at what I do. And so then when I dove into agronomy, um, basically I was dusting off some of my personal interests in chemistry and biology. And in fact, as a child, I really wanted to be a pharmacist. And um, so I never lost my passion for the sciences. And then I found a, a path or a, a way to blend my sales and, and business development acumen along with my sciences interests and, um, and developed a, a really rewarding career in what's called agronomy. So agronomy is even a term that's not terribly familiar to people, um, but basically it's a descriptor of what we do as agronomists. And we help farmers to make database decisions um, utilizing soil data, utilizing active ingredients, utilizing um, ag tech components such as um, genetics and um, field performance. And then we help to prove it out with the farmers. So there's a couple different groupings of agronomists. You have retail agronomists. You often find those like at a retail location that's selling fertilizer and chemicals. Um, you have more of a traditional educational um, or institutional type of an agronomist. They often work for labs. 
Um, they're often doing the research and development behind the scenes. And what we're trying to do is always bring the, the economics into the conversation along with the science. So we're sort of marrying those things together um, and helping farmers, agricultural producers make better and better and better decisions as we move forward. And so where that puts me today, because I have always had this particular interest in sciences, um, for, for whatever reason, soil science, soil physics, soil biology really made a lot of sense to me. And so through the educational process and the vocational training that I received on a daily basis, every step of the way through the development that I've gone through as a professional has been both in learning in the books as well as learning with my hands simultaneously. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's just been um in my opinion, probably one of the most valuable educational experiences I've ever had the privilege to have. And so where I'm at with this today is I've worked with corn and soybeans. I've worked with your row crop producers, which are, you know, things like sugar beets and um, dry edible beans like black beans and pintos. And then mm -hmm. over time, I've kind of evolved into more specialty crop. Um, there's there's a lot less known in the specialty crop market. <laughs> highly, highly specialized, hence the specialty crop terminology. Um, but it just it has a slightly different focus. And since I started, I really had a passion for soil health and understanding the soil health components. Right. I understood enough about so soil sciences to realize that almost everything that is happening above the soil is related to a process happening below the soil. And so that really inspired me to go deep into the soil health and soil quality aspects of this. So as I have developed my agronomy over the years, I've always had this very intense focus on soil health and soil quality and helping farmers to transition their farms away from practices that were damaging soil quality or in some way hindering um, soil health and transitioning over into different farming practices and hybrids of farming practices that make better sense for the soil. And now we're in that phase of being able to document those changes, improving out the math that that cover cropping system is working or a farmer wanting to implement some type of regenerative practices of some sort or transitioning to organic, whatever that may be. Um, they have somebody in their corner like me that can help them document, help them create a, a story, um, you know, with with information, data and um, and helping them to to build the ROI out for those changes. I mean, farmers have a huge responsibility, right, to produce crops to plug into the food source. But sometimes we're almost too disconnected from them to realize that if we don't prosper the farmers, the whole rest of our food structure and system collapses. So it's not about anybody having to get rich over this, but it is about having to stay in business, right? And um, so any business has to use data and informed decisions to keep getting better and better and better. And so we live in a climate right now um, that is suggesting that changes to our practices are very important and but we, we lack a lot of the depth of data. And so what I have started to do is create um, a, a series of tools. I haven't created the tools myself, but creating a system with these tools um, to help you document those things. And um, I'm part of a network of agronomists. It's a small network um, that are very passionate about this in specific. And um, we are really having a good time and building some amazing things out. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, I do have a relationship with TMAC Agro USA. Um, we're a crop nutrient company um, focusing very heavily on solutions that are geared towards um, promoting soil health as well as simultaneously planting, uh, supporting plant health. And um, I am a, a regional agronomy manager for them for the Great Lakes region. And I've been with that company for several years now. Um, and then I also have my Crop Scout Christie Consulting business where I take a much more personal and deeper dive into specific aspects of that documentation and fostering um, farmers to make transitions, um, whether it be in their practices or in their business models um, throughout the course of their growing seasons and, and year after year after year. Okay, so I have lots of questions because I yeah. think there's, you know, the but there's a lot of buzzwords being thrown around about regenerative practices, right? What does that mean? Like, what is what does that really mean for our farmers, and why should we be paying attention? And those that aren't on the farm, because I agree with you, there's this huge disconnect about where our food comes from or our clothes. 
or any of the, you know, any of the uh, fibers or materials that are being grown and harvested. You're absolutely correct, Mandy. And, and I think, unfortunately, some things have gotten this, this social cultural um, misnomer associated with it, right? So um, one of the hot topics that you hear almost daily, if you go, you know, into your Apple news or whatever your news posts, the top news of the day is, it's either COVID related or climate change related, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's, it's almost split 50-50 because somewhere along the line, somebody's going to find a way to tie the two together eventually, I think. But um, anyway, that's that's par par partially media doing what media does. Um, but behind the scenes, for the people that are in the trenches, and, and to answer the question that you just asked, you know, how do we connect people that aren't associated necessarily with agricultural, but maybe have an in interest in some other aspect of it and have some working knowledge of it? When you define regenerative, there is a it's a very broad scope okay and so within that within that pie or within that spectrum we'll say um obviously you're going to have this ultra purist approach all the way on to more of a transitional approach right so i like to think of regenerative agriculture in terms of a spectrum and um there's a there's a lot of people that want to debate about what it is what it isn't and it's usually the folks that are so Hell bent on putting actual boundaries on something that they lose track of the focus and then it detracts from the bigger picture. And that is to restore soil quality. You know, so the, so I like to think of defining regenerative ag in terms of these pillars or foundations, and that is to restore soil structure, which means actual the soil's actual ability to hold itself together and in a way that would support soil biological diversity as well as cropping diversity. Um, so that's one really major foundational pillar of a regenerative practice or regenerative practices in, in, in generalized terms. Another one of those um, would be to be integrating livestock to some degree. So there's value on in terms of what the animals are, re are leaving behind as well as what they're doing with their hooves or their feet, as well as what they're doing with plucking and pulling. Um, there's some really interesting things there that are that are being brought to light in terms of documentation and data so that we can better understand how these systems work together. Um, I like to also think of when I'm sharing regenerative practices with people, um, I like to think of one, just picking out one thing that a, a farm could do to help improve soil structure, right? So Improving soil structure, like I said, it, it not only helps the soil biological diversity, but also what's growing above it to have more nutritional density, right? So the access of nutrients and of enzymes and of cofactors that are in the soil is uptaken by the plant and produces a strawberry that has more nutrient value or more flavor compounds right. or more fragrances or more other other things that, that food does to us. Food is fuel for our bodies, right? So we get disconnected when we drive through county after county of just corn and soybeans. We are very disconnected from the the grand diversity that that food production truly is and how this is so deeply integrated into our soils and into our, our climates. Um, I think we want to grow everything everywhere, but I, I believe that we have pockets all throughout our, not just our nation, but all over the world that are really dis dispositioned or, or disposed to being very good for certain things, right? Okay. So it, in our quest to be able to produce, say, strawberries in every climate, we've done things to it and we've worked through challenges to adapt to that. And so... Um, you know, it's like we almost need to get back to where the native soils want to produce certain things um, in in higher quality or higher concentration than other certain things. So I really love the diversity of agriculture that we have here in Michigan. I'm Michigan based. I know you, you guys are out west a little bit. Uh, but in here in Michigan, you know, we're the second most diverse cropping state in the nation. Second only to California. And California is only able to have that production diversity because they're managing water, right? So, it, you know, we're, we're looking at, we, we have a, a treasure trove of native soils and native weather patterns here around these Great Lakes that lend itself to a ton of diversity, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I have dived into the, into the specialty crop realm. I work very heavily and closely with vineyards producing wine grapes. I work very closely with hops producers producing hops for for beer and spirits um 
all kinds of fruit production. And uh, on a daily basis, I really get exposed to a lot. Um, Michigan is also um, a, a, an early adopter of a hemp program, as well as a cannabis, a recreational cannabis state. We've been a medical cannabis state for a while, and we were just recently opened up into the recreational cannabis. So our cannabis industries in general are exploding here in Michigan, which is what brought you and I together, right? The, yeah. industrial, the industrial hemp side of things. Um, so yeah, so we, we really work hard in that. I don't want to, I don't want to drop the regenerative conversation because it's very valuable, but it's such a huge topic. I, you know, like I said, I want, I want to help people understand, um, that regenerative needs to be a spectrum when you're thinking about those practices. It isn't just one thing, right? right. And, so, and when a farmer Im implements just one thing, it affects all the other systems, right? This is a systems approach to agriculture. If you affect one piece of the puzzle, you are thereby affecting all the rest of the connectors and the pathways and everything else for the rest of that supply chain. So it's, it's, um, it's really interesting to be able to come alongside a farm and, and partner with them and helping them to make sense of some of those decisions. And sometimes it's coaching on soil biological diversity or, you know, as we're choosing a cover crop, maybe it's a multi-species cover crop so we can get different types of root architecture growing in the soil. Um, everything from how do we terminate it um, what kind of tillage should we be doing? You know, again, on that spectrum of regenerative is, you know, this ultra hardcore no-till, no soil disturbance, all the way up to medium tillage and, and, you know, a little bit more aggressive tillage. And so even though we're moving some soil or we're disturbing some soil, sometimes it's necessary depending on what our soil textures are, right? So there's so many layers of how to implement regenerative practices. It's very easy in my backyard garden to do that, right? right? I can do that very simply. I can compost a little pile for myself. I can do that very, very effectively. But when we're field scaling these things, when we're talking about taking my 100 by 100 garden and scaling those practices out to, say, a 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 acre farm, now you're, you're, the implications of every single decision you make to implement a regenerative practice of some kind is going to affect the whole system, whether or not we spray, what do we spray, whether or not we till, what do we till, what kind of tools do we need, whether or not we're going to intercede or we're going to, you know, I mean, there's just a whole myriad of things that is very, um, you know, it, it, I'm not trying to make it sound so complex that it's impossible to do. But what I'm saying is it can be a very complex transition. And if we're going to implement something with the intentions of restoring soil, documenting that change over time, is absolutely critical. And we're utilizing some phenomenal revolutionary tools in that documentation process, having a relationship with Rick and Liz Haney. Um, Rick has, a, a has developed a test called the Haney Soil Assessment. We're utilizing carbon burst testing to document whether or not we're making changes in the soil itself. So everything from our soil friability, whether or not it sticks together when I squish it in my hand and hold it together, all the way to the up to the point of what are our soil microbes telling us as far as what they're breathing in and out and, and the diversity, the water infiltration, you know, there's so many aspects that are associated with this. So living here in the Great Lakes, um, being very uh, protective of our waterways and our precious resource of water, um, this is paramount. Um, as farmers really start to look at their role and what the ways that they can contribute. Even though society has somewhat vilified farmers as being the biggest culprits and the biggest aggressors towards our environment, it really truly couldn't be more the opposite. Nobody cares more for the soil than the farmer making his living off of it. It's and, their livelihood. <laughs> And I, I, even though I work with several farms on a wide range of acreage, I have had no clients ever in the history of working in ag tell me that their goal is to make money off this farm and sell it off when they die. None. Right. None. <laughs> and, and so if that doesn't tell you something about the cultural, you know, appreciation for the quality of the land that a farmer truly has, it, that message to me is, is so important. And, but it's so um, antagonistic to the message that's out in, in the mainstream concept that farmers are the aggressors um, to, to our soils. What I'll say is when you teach farmers or when you partner with them and have an appreciation of where they're coming from and realize how 
much it takes to transition into these different practices really opens your mind about who cares for the soil and who's who, who talks about caring for the soil and who's doing something about caring for the soil, right? Those two groups are um, often on opposite sides of aisles, opposite sides of fences. And um, I'm really privileged to be able to work with farmers that are that are wanting to, to make those transitions. Okay, so how does hemp play into this, right? As you've been doing your research and looking, you know, looking at the um, increased yields or soil structure or any of these other pieces that I've heard hemp really plays a role in, what are you finding you know, when it comes to regenerative? How does it really impact the regenerative agriculture? So, I mean, you know, can cannabis cultivation in general is is documented back into the first human civilizations on this planet, right? And and it's it's interesting that we've been in a prohibitionist era on cannabis for the last you know nearly 100 years. Um, we I, I I find it also ironic that this is also when we're seeing um, that we're seeing the decline in our soil structures, and it makes me wonder. You know, are these two things related? Is part of the prohibition of cannabis somehow interconnected with the decline of our soil structure? When once upon a time in civilization, civilizations of old, this was a commonplace crop, and it was utilized in rotation, and it was utilized as a nurse crop. It was utilized in interseeding scenarios, and for so many different purposes. Long before there was plastics. Right. I mean, long before it, we there was a, a throwaway culture that we live in today. Right. In, in yeah. our civilized in our civilized world, you know. Um, yeah. So so those are the questions that like it, it really inspired me as I became uh, familiarized with field scale cannabis cultivation. It was mostly in the cannabinoid production realm. Right. So it was producing for CBD or THC or, you know, one of these other compounds that are utilized um, more as a. I'll just say more as a medicine. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Even, even outside the realm of classifying THC as like medical versus recreational, it's still utilized as, um, as a human, health health health, health. human health aid, right? Yeah, it's neutral. It's like a nutraceutical or Correct, vitamins yes. or whatever. You know, any of those that. Right. And I'm sure I'm not making any claims about what it is no. or isn't. It. But, yeah. but just, you know, so this was the context where I became. You know, I I boarded the train. The hemp train, really. Um, I was really interested in that. And, and so as I was able to bring in some field scaling expertise, um, what I what I saw immediately diving in was the soil quality aspects and how industrial hemp was utilized in a lot of native um, agricultural systems, you know, from indigenous peoples that were utilizing hemp in between crops that we were feeding their peoples. And for the purpose of restoring soil or managing a pest of some kind or creating rows to protect crops in between, um, you know, some really interesting things that, again, this living in a prohibitionist era, we don't have stacks of resources or extension agencies that are that have, you know, volumes of published data on this. These are old books that were published in the 1800s or, you know, more or less farmer diaries for lack of a better term, farmer diaries just documenting this anecdotal evidence and field observation saying when we had hemp here or there, this is what we did with it, this is how it worked, and this is what it did for us. And so kind of you know, bringing together my knowledge on soil quality and soil health, root structure really, really inspired me. So in my cannabinoid production experience, what we were seeing with these monstrous plants um, was this really beautiful, you know, multidimensional root structure that was creating channels, right? So when we penetrate the soil with these these beautiful roots, we want the fibrous roots to help break up soil compaction. We want these giant tap roots to help break up soil compaction. So we have to sometimes plant multiple species of cover crops in order to achieve that. What we're finding with this cannabinoid production system and the way that we we're planting it, we were getting these massive roots that had all of those qualities kind of combine, right? Which is not, not very typical. A lot of times plants are classified by their types of roots, right? And so it's like, man, there's just, you know, reason number 3 million that we need to, to 
put hemp back in our soils, right? So when, when, we, when we have diverse root exploration in the soil structure, what we're doing is creating channels for water to go down and for, you know, for um, the soil microbial interactions to take place, right? This plant's signal through its root structures as it's pushing sugars back down, it's called exudates, it's feeding different microbial populations. And each plant has its own signature. And each plant has its own terpene profile that it, that it uses to speak these languages that um, are spoken by things that have no words, right? This is amoebas and, and bacterial and, and fungal, you know, all, all different scales and even larger arthropods, bugs and, and, and mammals that live in the soil that rely on this, right? So yeah. bringing in this really incredible root density and, and, and root structure even in our high population scenarios, industrial hemp just has this beautiful ability to, to penetrate and, and cover a lot of surface area. Um, mm -hmm. with, a, with a root ball like this, they're they're, there's so much root density there. Um, it's really, you know, it's really a beautiful thing. So um, hemp really inspired me in, in that way. It was an aha moment for me realizing that my purpose in this space, because there's very few agronomists that want to touch the cannabis space, mm -hmm. right? There's very few people that are classically trained agronomists that are sit sit in the seat that I sit that are like, yeah, sign me up for a new crop. Sign yeah. me up for a crop that's been illegal for uh, 80 plus years, right? Like nobody's saying that. So I, I kind of was looking around at the at the resources around me and saying, uh, hey, who's doing this? And it was crickets. <laughs> Like it was like a handful of, of extension agents that were like, uh, yeah, we were just assigned hemp by our extension. Um, so I'm the hemp educator. <laughs> and, and these are incredibly smart people and highly adaptive educators, which is wonderful and are helping to speed the light, right? They're helping to speed the light to the masses and, and to the agricultural community that are trying to learn, but the documentation is having to be done too, right alongside, you know, we're, like I said, we're in the labor and delivery room of, of a, a beautiful industry that I think is going to have, I mean, just exponential impact on recovering our soils, which will impact our climate. And the way that it impacts, impacts our climate is unpredictable for us because of the cyclical nature of climates. Um, we have to ha keep that in respect, right? And, and Or in retrospect, we have to keep that in uh, the context of, you know, everything we do is going to have an impact. And so if we can impact things in a positive way, there isn't a downside to restoring soil quality. There isn't. <sighs> So, so everything we can do in a, in a large scale cropping system to introduce hemp on a, even a small scale for a farmer that wants to talk about regenerative practices, I love to start with, you know, like, well, farmers want to start with rye because it's simple and we can terminate it and it's cost effective. It's not super expensive. And so they're, they're not spread out risk wise, financial risk wise, terribly. Industrial hemp, I see if we can get our seed production to that point, I believe that we can we could utilize industrial hemp in this way, even if we're not harvesting it for, uh, you know, a 12 foot tall plant to harvest it for, um, you know, long, long grain fiber, you know, for plastics application. If we could incorporate that back into the soil or let it die back naturally or or do something else with it to create a weed mat of some kind, you know, these things are so um, beautifully integrated into how they play off of each other. You know, one of the challenges that a farmer will face as they're integrating regenerative practices is how do I manage weeds, right? I I want to produce a crop, but I don't want to have too many weeds that I'm not producing enough crop to be profitable, right? So right. this is where this, this is like that, you know, that conundrum mm -hmm. we're constantly in, you know, we want to save the soil, but we have to stay in business. And one thing shouldn't come at the detriment of the other. Right. So so I, I, I see hemp, you know, as I've as I've built out this, you know, this data set, working on some projects with some incredibly innovative companies that are so committed to to making this work. You know, Heartland Materials, for example, is, you know, just it is my 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 cup is just overflowing with the passion that's coming from these guys and the mm -hmm. business acumen an execution plan that they have to integrate hemp into, you know, feathering hemp into all kinds of applications and utilizing, you know, 
expert materials engineers and, and chemists and scientists and production systems engineers to, to create a system that works. And, um, you know, partnering with other innovators within, you know, businesses that are already established that are like, yeah, we're interested in utilizing a hemp-based polymer, make it profitable for us, make it pay. Right. That's yeah. the biggest, that's what's one of hemp's biggest challenges on the fiber side is, okay, well, we can produce hemp textiles, but it costs 10 X of what some, you know, we can't have a hundred percent hemp fiber shirt because our people won't be able to afford it. So where does it play a role in marrying and partnering and feathering into a well-established textile production industry like the cotton industry? How do those things play together or connect? In some of these other, you know, Kanaf is a cousin of cannabis um, that has this textile application potential, right? So when you look at all of the, the application, like the end use life cycle application opportunities with industrial hemp, and you start working the equation backwards into, okay, how do we build it into here? And then how do we make it fit into here? Now we're back to the soil. You know, it, it, starts, it starts and ends with the soil. Right. So this is this has been my involvement. This has been where um, where hemp has really um, become part of the the fabric of my my existence and where I see us taking this. The, the group of, of agronomists that I that I have this this phenomenal family network with. It's, it's just wonderful when we get together periodically. You know, they're, we're talking through and helping each other as our farmers and our clients are navigating challenges. And, and somebody will inevitably say, um, well, does anybody have any ideas for this? And I'm like, well, obviously hemp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, just clearly, like, I'm just sitting there waiting for somebody to ask, you know, what's my opinion? And I, I and can almost always respond with, if you included, you know, say 10 pounds of hemp seed in your cover crop blend, what could that literally do for you? Provide additional support for the soil structure. Maybe when they're going to roll it down and crimp it down and then plant into it, you know, then we have these plants that are about four or five foot tall instead of our rye, which is much thinner. We have a, a completely different type of weed mat to lay down, planting it, you know, integrating hemp into these other systems. So utilizing hemp, not just for, to harvest for grain or fiber or, you know, whatever, cannabinoid, but to utilize it in, or integrate it into cover cropping systems in, in actual intentional soil recovery systems, um, you know, or in filter strips where we need to protect waterways and we're producing or we're planting a grass blend of some kind, you know, that would be a phenomenal place for a, for a farmer who's, you know, committed this, this waterway or this section of land along the river or stream to plant some hemp in there you know, along with the rest of the, the cover crop blend to promote that biological diversity, to promote, you know, uh, pollinator havens and that kind of thing. I mean, there's just, there's just so many aspects of it that just really speak well to um, how, how revolutionary hemp is, how old it is, but now how revolutionary it, it's becoming. It's becoming a tool of a green revolution. And, um, and I think that there's just endless implications of how this can play into all of that. Well, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were not dummies. You know, they were, right. they, you know, there's a reason that they, I mean, wasn't it Thomas Jefferson that said the best thing we can do for our country is introduce a new crop to our, our rotation. And here we have that opportunity. And I believe it's the last, the last chance, right? Soybeans were how many years ago? And it took 40 plus years to be, bring them mainstream. And I think if there was another crop, we would have it, right? We would right. have seen it already. Um, right. There's a couple of questions that come in. I want to um, I want to address some of them. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, decontamination qualities of hemp, of industrial hemp? I'm assuming uh, so, the remediation. Yeah. So so industrial hemp has been has been broadly used in um, in areas of like, for example, um, the petrochemical companies of the, you know, mid century, a lot of the waste products. And as we were learning how to use these tools and these chemical compounds, um, into, into various, um, you know, modern applications, they were, they're burying the waste and, or they were putting the waste into barrels and burying the barrels, right? Like that, yep. they just, they don't know, they didn't know at that time, or 
I want to believe that that there wasn't a willful um, malice towards our soil. Um, but but what we discovered is, you know, these materials degrading into the soil structure obviously are creating all kinds of water, groundwater contamination issues and, and um, you know, destroying the biological diversity or causing other, you know, the soil is like a vacuum. So when if we exterminate all these healthy bacteria, something's going to fill its place. In a lot of situations, you know, um, invasive species more or less have taken over because there was this absence of predatory balance. And um, so there's a lot of, of, of a lot of Googleable documentation on hemp remediation. And one of the most interesting, in my opinion, um, implications there is in the in the um, in the Ukraine and then also in Fukushima um, areas that had, uh, you know, small scale nuclear releases um, mm -hmm. that they were that they were not able to capture out of the atmosphere. But the nuclear contamination um, in the nuclear decay that's taking place in the soil is creating these these environments that are you know, um, very detrimental to human health and to, and to biological health or, or just, you know, ecosystem health, we'll say, um, because we're the top of the food chain. And so if all the little critters go bye-bye, guess what happens to us, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we, we, if you think of it in terms of the, of the, the lion on the savanna, you know, he's the top of the food chain, but he doesn't exist if he doesn't have a food source. And if you affect that food source down lower in the food chain, you know, naturally it's eventually going to get caught up to the, 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 the big guys in the food chain, which is us, you know what I mean? So it's important for us to kind of keep in mind how, how absolutely precious and essential this, this these biological balances are. Um, and so you know, they're utilizing industrial hemp um, to remediate and to pull out some of those contaminants. Um, and when we call it remediation, that's a large term, right? So remediation can be everything from, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a scratch is technically remediation. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and so we don't, we're not necessarily looking for band-aids. We're looking for, for more systemic healing abilities. And, um, and so the research is, is underway and the documentation is being done on exactly what the lifespan is of this and exactly how much time it's taking to recover some of this, these soils. Um, and are we capturing carbon and retaining it? Are we capturing contaminants and retaining them? Um, we do know that, you know, we have to be very cautious about where we plant cannabinoid based industrial hemp or cannabis right. because it loves to pull things out of the soil like chromium and aluminum and, you know, these things that we don't want in, into our bodies, rendering it unusable. And right. although some remediation can be done on the flower material for that, by and large, um, it renders it unusable for human consumption. It has to go into other applications. Um, but we're trying to we're trying to better understand that as a science community. That's not something that I'm directly involved in specifically, but at, at the environmental engineering group and the environmental protection groups that exist out there are heavily vested in understanding what industrial hemp is able to do in terms of soil remediation and in high high stakes areas like the Fukushima release areas, like some of these, you know Chernobyl type places that exist in areas that were never properly decommissioned um, right. over time. And subsequently, you know, accidents happen or places like here in Michigan, you know, not too, just not too far from here. In fact, um, there was a, a shoe manufacturing company who was, you know, sealing and gluing shoes together throughout the forties, fifties and sixties and didn't realize the waste product from their plant was going, yeah, was was eventually going to make their water for their community undrinkable. You know, so that those those things is there an, is there an application for industrial hemp here? I think so, right? Yeah. And so um, depolitis depoliticizing um, the the cannabis conversation is is very important, and it'd be very very helpful for us to be able to put it into these places to understand better what are the bigger implications here. And um, you know, I, I just I did, there's some really cool things. So. That was a long uh, response to that question, but yeah, there's some very cool stuff happening in that space. Very cool. Okay, there are a lot of questions, but I something that comes up all the time is water. When we're comparing, you know, hemp to an alfalfa or any of these other main crops, or hay, or what what are we looking at? You know, sometimes people say, "Oh, it doesn't use any water. We don't need to use any pesticides." Can you speak to both of those? Yeah, I mean, so. 
the first comparison that you made, like alfalfa compared to industrial hemp, for example, um, alfalfa's plant use, I think the, the plant use, we have to take into consideration. What are we using the plant for? Alfalfa is used for forage. It's cut. It has a lot of water content in the biomass when you cut it. Um, then they chop it into pieces, it ferments, and then it goes into the livestock industry for feed. Um, and it gets added to various parts of the feed val or total, um, you know, feed spectrum, I guess you could say. Very infrequently are livestock animals fed just one thing. They're mostly fed blends of things, and hay happens to be one of them, alfalfa. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then there's this regenerate, this, this uh, regenerative property of, a, of an alfalfa plant. We cut it it regenerates leaf tissue. We cut it again, you know, sometimes two and three times, or maybe even up to five times in a growing season, um, depending on how, um, how intensive a management system it is. So there's a water requirement there based on its per ton that's removed from the field. So if you're removing a total of five tons, you know, over the course of a growing season, there's a tremendous amount of water required to do that. Um, here in Michigan, we get a lot of rainfall naturally. There's other areas where, you know, like out in, in the Midwest, you know, there's a lot of alfalfa grown in like Colorado where they get very little rainfall. They're almost exclusively reliant on the snow melt for their in reservoir systems to, to feed their cropping systems almost all under pivot. So, so the question is, is are, do we have the right crops planted in the right places? Right. So right. because our ranching, our ranching industry has changed into less rangeland and more concentrated feeding. You know, the, the ranchers, I think, actually have a much more balanced concept of these multi-species feed systems yeah. than, you know, than say, for example, a livestock system that would be reliant on a more, um, a more closed system or whatever you want to call it there. Um, so to take that into perspective, that's really not apples to apples. To say this plant requires yeah. more water than this plant, sure. Alfalfa is going to take a heck of a lot more water than what an industrial hemp plant is because we're growing an industrial hemp plant for a very different purpose. Although we could use the grain into the feed system, although we're studying to see if there's some value of herd or, you know, some component of that hemp plant that could be utilized into the livestock nutritional system. We don't have those answers yet with definitive um, USDA support. And again, it, it's, it's, be, it's partially because it's a politicized conversation. Um, we're more concerned of the politics of it, less concerned of the practical implementation of it. And so as, a, in, as an industry advocate, and I know Mandy, you and I are on the same page with this, the louder we shout and the more we do to educate and to, to move that steam engine along the tracks, the, the better we'll be in understanding how to respond to those types of things. Now, if you know, I could grow my, I can grow my um, marijuana plants in Colorado and in Oregon with very little water, you know, and it grows in very, um, you know, arid climates, it can. So, but that's not really a defense because we're also growing it in jungle environments as well. Mm -hmm. So there's different strains and different, different cultivar genetics that thrive in the whole entire global, you know, if, if you if you looked at these strains that thrive in this arid climate, then you took them to equatorial areas, which which are much more muggy and whatever, and they have different cultivars of cannabis that are thriving there. So I don't buy it that you can grow hemp without water. It's a plant. It creates biomass. It requires water. And I've seen this year we planted a lot of dry land fiber hemp without irrigation. And we saw some issues, especially the early plants and stuff struggled along. The things that we had under pivot that had water supplied to it looked phenomenal. And we had very few challenges there, but we have other, you know, it isn't necessarily, um, hemp requires so much less water than others. We have cultivars that have adapted to drought tolerances versus, you know, heavy wetter conditions where they never dry out. Those, those cultivars are probably better dispositioned to resist diseases that are associated with um, more humid, muggier climates, right? So, you know, th this is really important work that's being done right now here in the States. I know that there is a cultivar, um, some research being done down in Texas where, you know, they're muggy, but dry. They don't get a lot of rainfall. Um, it's, it's muggy climate because they're, you know, on the Gulf Coast. 
um, but they really don't get a lot of rainfall there. And so we're really trying to understand where these cultivars produce best and Mm -hmm. leveraging on, on genetics that have been developed in countries that haven't been cannabis prohibitionists that have been supportive of producing industrial hemp in different places. So here in, in the, in one of the projects I'm working on, we're looking at um, genetics from seven or eight different countries and in regions that have vastly different environmental um, structures. And here in Michigan, we get just about everything. I mean, it's hot and humid out here today, but we went through a pretty significant drought early in the season, which is when we get a majority of our rain. And there's some areas here in Michigan, we get up to, you know, 36 to 48 inches of rain. And so that's very different than say where you're at in Utah. You know, I mean, this is, this is important information for us to, to recognize. So it's unfair to generalize hemp and say, you can grow it without, without water. Well, so can I, but is it a quality? Is it, is it producing what we want it to produce? Is it stressed out to the point where it's triggering um, hermaphroditing that we don't necessarily want, even in our grain and fiber? We want, we want that to be more of a controlled situation and less unpredictable. And so when we throw our plants into climate scenarios that it's not comfortable with, we end up with unpredictable results. That doesn't work for field scaling. Mm-hmm. That works in my, my little garden. That doesn't work for field scaling. So in order to produce enough material for, say, Lego, who is who has publicly announced that they want to include X percentage of hemp-based plastics into their Lego products by such and such year, we need to produce enough material on spec to be able to do that. And, and to have that kind of unpredictability that we're just pulling, you know, ditch weed from one region to the next we're going to get a lot of variability there. And I think it's important to let the genetics companies do this work these first few years and, um, and not get too, too carried away and too romanticizing the, um, the fact that you can grow it anywhere. Um, growing it where it should be grown is probably the best thing for it. Right. Cause then we can maximize our output. We can, we can maximize what the plant's potential is and couple that with producing enough material to plug it into a system. I mean, we can't even produce enough seed this year to fulfill. If say, if one of the automakers decides they want to do two percent hemp-based bioplastics next year, we literally couldn't produce enough hemp in the U.S. to fulfill that. I I just got off a conversation with Hannah uh, about this. About you know, Europe has been supplying a lot of our seeds. Europe yeah. cannot keep up with the United States production. We're yeah. huge, and our opportunity to manufacture is massive. And so, you know, yes, the production of hemp has been a focus in getting these processing facilities in, but now where do we get our seeds? <laughs> where do we bring in the production and what? where is it growing, right? When we scale. Yeah. This. Yes. So it comes back to scale and uniformity and understanding the regional diversity of cultivars. Um, you know, the, it, it seems like a simple concept, but in order to, to do that on a scale that American agriculture would adapt mm-hmm. this into their systems, um, whether it be on a regenerative basis or whether it be part of their crop rotation basis um, or some blending of both, you know, it, we have to be able to, to say, okay, these cultivars produce well in Texas. These cultivars produce well in these regions. We can say mm-hmm. with confidence that this is not going to handle droughty, you know, scenario, you need to put this under pivot and that kind of thing. So, you know, there's, those are the components that, that I personally engage deeply into. And, um, and then there's, there's a whole, you know, it's like Pandora's box. And when, once we start talking about like root structure and, and how strong a stem would be to resist certain types of, you know, I mean, there's so many different aspects of what makes this plant viable for its end use. Um, it, it, can, it can really get lost in the in the weeds on it. So um, we'll just suffice it to say that this is another very, very important year of research and development and kind of classifying and developing some standard operating procedures or standard um, operation suggestions um, for yeah. farmers to take heed on. And then um, working with agronomists like myself who have have gone down the rabbit hole of, of cannabis specialty um, I work with several, you know, recreational uh, marijuana producers as well. And, you know, the things that we've learned and mistakes that we've made in industrial hemp, I'm able to bring over to these guys who've never planted hemp before 
And it's right. like, you know, here's one of the things that I think we might be seeing. And this is why I think it, let's dig a plant up and take a look at the roots and see what's going on under there. And that's not something that, that would be very common for that commercial scale production to do for that realm. But it's, you know, taking things we're learning over here and bringing it into this side and taking things we're learning over here and bringing it into this side and, and, um, and, and opening our minds to how to produce larger scale, higher quality, regionally suited fiber hemp or grain hemp or cannabinoid. Consistent, consistent right? We, before we start producing in mass production, we've got to be able to be, have consistent genetics and consistent right. production. And, yeah, yes. I'm with you. Okay, so before I get to Jeff's question really quick, what about pest management? Now, there's a lot of talk that, you know, cannabis is great because you also don't need any pesticides. But I also know that to not be necessarily true. Right, so pesticide application is a choice, right? Um, if you have a, a, a specific pest, whether it be a disease, or some species of bug attacking your plant in a way that is going to be detrimental to your yield, it's important for you to understand the origin. So when I talk about a systems approach um, to plant production, this is really what I'm talking about. So if I have an aphid infestation on my soybean plants, aphids are opportunistic. And if a soybean plant is healthy, they have no reason to spend the extra energy to attack it. It costs them energy to attack a healthy plant. So they're looking for plants that have been damaged or are struggling or maybe have soil imbalances in some way. That's true of nearly every infestation with a few exceptions, right? So in modern agriculture, right now we're, you know, this, this time of year we're facing a Japanese beetle um, infestation in things like grapes and hops and they defoliate the leaves and they make it so the plant can't produce photosynthesis or complete the photosynthetic process. Um, it really can damage a lot of things, but there's a threshold there of damage. We have to be willing to tolerate some leaf damage and allow things to balance out, um, you know, in order to do that. We have to get our heads out of the concept that, you know, we live here too with the bugs. <laughs> Uh, you know, so a certain amount of a certain amount of leaf damage can be tolerated without damaging the yield. But understanding what that threshold is is very important. Well, understanding what pest is attacking your plant is very, very important. In cannabis production for cannabinoids, we fight mites, terrible, but mainly in our droughty climate, our droughty arid climates. Here in Michigan, we don't really struggle with mites on the outdoor scale as much as we do on the indoor scale. So the indoor controlled environment production systems actually tend to have, you know, a different set of pests that they, that they you know, encounter and, and have to fight off. And one of the main things that, you know, in my opinion, that the cannabis plant has going for it in terms of native um, ability to resist pests is that we haven't been spraying it with pesticides. And I know that sounds kind of goofy to say it like that, but we haven't developed resistance in hemp for these things because we haven't been using the pesticides on them. So the pesticides that we do recommend or we do have access to are mainly biological based or, um, or are utilized like in our organic copying systems like Bacillus thernogenis and Bt. We use that to attack specific worms that might be eating our plant, defoliating. Um, but we only use that if we're at a, an economic threshold to justify it, right? Or if we're at a growth stage that's going to really damage the plant. Like right now, I don't care if I have a worm infestation in my fiber hemp. We're all going to be completely harvested here in Michigan within the next three weeks, right? Mm -hmm. But three, two and a half months ago, I saw a worm infestation and they were burrowing right into the joints, right into the growth point on those plants and interfering with the branches. So we'd have a branch droop, right? That's an issue. And we had to address that issue utilizing a biological based pesticide. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't want to go out there with something that was going to kill my pollinators. I want my pollinators, right? We want to have an environment that is biologically diverse and healthy. Um, but also we have to keep in mind, we have to be able to field scale this and how bad the infestation is. So yes, the cannabis plant does have a lot of natural resistance to things, but it's also pretty you know susceptible to powdery mildew, which will grow on the base of the plants in high plant density populations. It's not as bad in our cannabinoid production because we're planting 2,500 plants per acre. But say, for example, on our, our fiber, where we've got plants, you know, we've got in a 12 by 12, you know, section, we might have as much as 30 plants, 20, 20 to 30 plants. 
-hmm. So the, the airflow is restricted through that area. So you might have a pathogen that wants to start climbing up there where it's, you know, it's, the environment is good. You have to just keep an eye on that. I don't really have a, something that I would go after that with, but maybe on a preventative side of things, you would use more of a terpene based neem oil, um, things that would be more um, in tune with plants naturally resisting or strengthening the immune system or the plant's stress response versus applying a pesticide after the fact, right? So if we're strengthening our plant health and a proactive approach, we're going to have a better outcome if we do get an infestation or if we do undergo stressors, the plants or the, the pests can't be quite so opportunistic to go and damage the yield. We might sustain some leaf damage. We might sustain a little bit of stock, um, stock structure compromising, um, but it's not going to be catastrophic. So I like to take a much more holistic approach when it comes to um, pest management on cannabis in general, but I do that also in hops and grapes and other cropping systems. It, right. just, it, it makes better sense to have a strengthened immune system than to have to take a, a dose of a pill once we're sick, right? Mm -hmm. So taking a more uh, a more approach of of wholeness and plant health um, prevention instead of being reactive, right? We're proactive, and instead right. of yeah, and like you said, that's where we get to scale. We can't if it's constantly trying to put fires out, right? Um, right. Jeff has a question. Let's see. It's uh, cannabis is listed as an invasive species in Florida, hence no pollen or seed. Has, have you seen uh, cannabis as an invasive species in other regions or is non-native cohabitating species more accurate? Well, I kind of like the, I like the terminology there. Non-native cohabitating species, I think is very accurate. Um, I think that hemp being listed as an invasive species may be a bit of a misnomer. And, you know, without diving into the origin of that, of that definition for, for Florida. Um, I know that it, water hemp, which is a, fa a pigweed family weed here, has gotten the nickname of hemp and, oh, yes. has, and has gotten some, so given some negative publicity to industrial hemp, right? Um, there's a lot of native hemp grown all over the US. Um, it's, it, it was, ne it, it quit being commercially cultivated in Pennsylvania, um, but it never quit growing. Right? Exactly. So well, still, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can still go to Adams County, Pennsylvania today and quite, quite <laughs> certainly find happy, healthy, thriving, multi-species, self-pollinating, self-seeding patches of industrial hemp <laughs> thriving. Okay. <laughs> so it is possible that the terminology of hemp there may be um, oriented to lumping that into a bigger weed species or weed family um, inadvertently. Um, but if it's literally, if it's, if it's considering, you know, sativa, uh, you know, cannabis sativa, that plant being invasive, um, I would really question that. Um, it's, it's native to everywhere. So <laughs> yeah. So I have a hard time believing that'd be considered invasive other than maybe that again, that may be associated with the politicizing of of the, the prohibitionist era is my guess. I don't know, but yeah, that's interesting. Now now you got now you got me thinking, Jeff. I'm gonna have to go dig into that one. <laughs> Thanks for the question though. Well I think that that's a good explanation of what we're starting to see, right? Is now hemp is being lumped in anytime the word hemp is thrown out. And the hemp's used in fiber, right? Some fiber production. And so there's yeah, there's lots of education that still has to happen. And there were a couple of people that kept saying, you're right, Eric, we know, or there's education that needs to happen. Very much um, so. Or, and education is the best. I got tied up reading the comments that are coming in. So I wanted to say thank you everybody for leaving comments, Jay and Mac, Jeff. Um, I see Karen on here. Somebody asked, are there any uh, peer reviewed journals willing to publish some of these studies? Uh, do you want to kind of, I know in the beginning you kind of touched on um, eventually being able to open up some of this research and really being involved in the research. What's a time frame before this information may be available to people? So like the other university so, study or credit, you know, credible re resources, I guess. Right. Yeah. So, so at the university level, um, this this is kind of this is kind of gross and it really breaks me heart 
and I know there's going to be people on this call today that are going to identify with this wholeheartedly, but I've talked a, a lot of uh, moments. I've alluded to the politicizing of the cannabis. Yes. Prohibition, okay. Um, the, the politicizing of the cannabis prohibition, which in my opinion is still in effect because yes. the banking industry will not accept it because of the federal, you know, the federal verbiage and the way that they're funded at the end of the day, most of the reason why we don't have peer reviewed, you know, professional journals with a plethora of information out there has to do with where the funding is coming from for the projects. Right. So very, very recently and, and almost exclusively in the context of understanding the carbon impact of industrial hemp has research about hemp become a priority or a funded priority. Or, mm -hmm. or a conversation. Right. Or it a conversation. Is, hemp sits in the forefront of the carbon discussion for sure. But it truly, it truly does. So I would expect within within the very near future, I would, would expect this 2020 growing season to have produced some of our very first peer reviewed type academia, um, you know, scholar papers. And, and I think that we will continue to see more and more as our land grant universities are given more, um, more freedom to explore this. I know our land grant here in Michigan, uh, Michigan State University, attempted for two seasons to do some cultivar research. And, you know, because nobody really had operating protocols for these folks, you know, they're just like, what do we do with it? And they're, so they're studying like what herbicides are, is it susceptible to, because if it's going to be involved in a rotational thing, you know, this is, this is a whole nother set of peer reviewed information that needs to come forward. You know, if I'm going to be spraying a herbicide on my corn rotation, how long before that herbicide is dissipated in the soil enough for it to be safe to plant hemp into the following season, or is it two years or three years? We have rotation restrictions on herbicides. So we have to think of it in the context of like how many moving parts are associated with implementing this, right? We, we have to recognize that the cultivar, um, suscept or cultivar specificity of the, of the region we have to take a look at what other crops are grown in that region if we're going to be able to you know is our herbicide programs or our weed management programs compatible with it or will it kill the hemp if we plant it into it is it still potent enough to kill the hemp the following season you know all of these things that that's very critically important for us to get out there um i have been asked non-stop since the first minute i've been involved in the cannabis industry about peer-reviewed you know, academia stuff, and, and it's and it's practically laughable. People are doing research behind the scenes, but it's all coming out of the private sector right now. Mm -hmm. Even the projects that I'm working on is coming exclusively out of the private sector. And guess who's interested in it? The land grant. Hey, would you guys mind sharing your data with us? Uh, well, <laughs> so you want us to pay for it and do all the legwork, yeah. and well, you have the resources. That's right. Of course, we don't mind sharing the, the information because we're passionate about moving the industry forward. But somebody but it shows first. <laughs> it shows how backwards it is, right? And yes. what has it taken? Because now I'm starting to see the shift, right? Like you said, because of the climate change and the urgency around it, hemp is being put at the forefront of the conversation, yes. right? But yes. it has taken, I mean, how many years have you been in this and you've seen this almost a 180 flip. And for me in the last two years, that's absolutely what I've seen is, really? but then again, I, I was questioned because I eat, breathe and sleep these conversations. <laughs> right. right. So, you know, so, so am I just talking to myself? So or? Working, working in, in other agricultural circles, like I do, you know, it, this is, this is, this is like a piece of me, right? This is, this has my heart, my, you know, my heart and my passion is, is definitely, you know, hemp focused. But it is still like, you know, a sliver of the cropping systems that I interact with. And so I still today will get questions from like, you know, other other farmers that I interact with or other businesses that I interact with that are like, you know, like hemp's not really even a thing anymore. And I just I just chuckle and I'm like, you, you don't you don't even realize we're at I feel like we're in a tsunami right now. Right. Like the the, <laughs> the alarms haven't even gone off yet that the wave is coming, but it's coming. And I think this year, 2021, is going to produce a ton of that research that she was just asking about. I'm really excited about that. But it's predominantly going to be coming from the private sector 
which does call into question, um, you know, traditionally calls into question motives and, you know, predictive outcomes and things like that, right? Like the people doing the research want this industry to move forward. And so, you know, naturally, we want things to succeed. It's like you said, the people that are sitting at the lighthouse, they all know that we need it to happen because if we don't, everybody in the forest is going to be hit by the tsunami. Yes. Or, you know, and that's exactly what's for everybody on land. And that's, that's really what happened. I look at this as I, I talk about it because I want to give people an opportunity to make the change before we have to make the change, before you're penalized for it, right? Or before it's too late. And right. we, we're running out of time. <laughs> um, but we're already at an hour, Christy. I could talk to you forever. Multiple times I had butterflies because it's just, yeah, you're, you're preaching everything that I think people need to hear more and more often. Um, real quick, if people are trying to get in touch with you or have some questions or um, would like to, I guess, work with you, how do people reach out? How do people connect? So you can find me on pretty much all the social media platforms, um, Crop Scout Christy. Um, my Instagram is Crop Scout Christy Lee. I'm on LinkedIn as Christy Lee Apple. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me on any of those social media um, sites. I do have a website. It's under construction right now, but it's CropScoutChristy.com. And um, you'll be able to, you know, at least submit a form, an email form, and, and connect with me um, so that we can have a conversation. Um, one of the things that I, I get questioned a lot on is how do I get started in the industry and where I would, would always encourage you to you know for those of us that are on this call we're already like bought into industrial hemp to some degree right and so the one thing that i would challenge everybody on this call to to take into consideration even before you reach out to me is is are you talking about hemp with people outside of your the, the sound the sound room right um we're preaching to the choir here in so many ways and so one of the missions that i have for my business and for my reach is to expand out into other broad, broader agricultural circles and help to introduce the concept of soil regenerative practices and the implementation of industrial hemp to some degree on their farm. I want farmers all across America to visualize what industrial hemp could do for their farm and the ways that they can contribute to our economy here in the U.S with that crop in their system in some way, shape or form. So, um, you know, just keep, keep fighting the good fight and, and, you know, that that's the way to do it. And, um, following and, and sharing things that I post about uh, industrial hemp helps. And then being a part of an organization like global health hemp association is absolutely uh, membership for that is absolutely um, priceless and being a part of that and getting information that's good quality so that you can then go and turn it out and share it into your circles of influence outside of our our family here, our hemp family. And I think linking arms, like one thing, you know, being able to link arms within a group and a network so that you aren't, you know, preaching, you're not speaking into an echo chamber, right? It really is as an association or as a group, we have an obligation also to stop the false information. And right. I think that that's where, you know, that's where the collaboration becomes so valuable. So with that, Chrissy, uh, perfect transition. I invite everybody to join Global Health Association. We're actually in the middle of a big membership push right now. We're over halfway there and we're getting ready to launch a big software that I'm really excited. Uh, it really it promotes the collaboration. It allows us to do small groups, the ideation, uh, share this information and content, really communicate with each other. And so I'm excited to have everybody join. You can find any information on our website, globalhubassociation.org. And then tomorrow afternoon, uh, you'll find it on our LinkedIn and our webpage. We are meeting, uh, Greg Wilson is coming to present about hemp wood um, in the construction building materials. So we kind of hit it all and I think you said something so important, speaking to people that are outside of that, you know, outside of the industry and how do we really bridge that gap so that we know, you know, I, I was saying to somebody the other day, I feel like our goal has been to bring manufacturing to farm or farm to manufacturing, reconnecting these pieces. Uh, and so that's what we're all about. But thank you very, very much, Christy, for joining. Any last words you want to add before we hang up? No, I just wanted to thank you for inviting me and and uh, working with the scheduling uh, drama of the last three months so for us to have this conversation and uh, for sharing your platform with me so that I can introduce myself and um, help those of us that are in, in this fight to know that there's people like me that are advocating 
um, in ways that are both environmentally health focused and practically practical farmer implementation focused as well. So thanks again and, and appreciate the questions. And if anybody wants to reconnect with me, like I said, hey, hit me up on social media. Um, I always respond to my messages there and um, you guys have an amazing day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christy. And thank you everybody else for joining. We'll see you later.